Hello everyone, and welcome to Lang Profiles. Today's topic is going to be verb valency, which is just another quality that verbs have. To explain verb valency, I'll connect this to a similar idea that you've likely heard if you've taken a science class, valence electrons. It's the same word, and they mostly mean the same thing. In case you don't know what a valence electron is, Basically, it's the electrons of an atom that are, that are in the outer shell that participate in chemical reactions. And this is also a good way to think about verbs. Each verb has a certain valency attached to it. So each electron essentially stands for the participants of the verb. You've likely heard of the subject and object of a sentence. The subject is basically just the doer of something, and the object is the thing that is having something be done to it. For example, in the sentence, he eats pie, he is the one doing the eating, and the pie is being eaten. Therefore, he is the subject and pie is the object. And there are also indirect objects, which are usually accompanied by a preposition to denote the receiver of an action. When I say, I give the book to her, the book is the direct object. It's what the verb give is directly affecting to her is what it's indirectly affecting. Of course, if any of these objects are left out, the sentence becomes ungrammatical. Prepositions are often thought of as different words altogether, but they're actually related to noun cases, which is something you don't really need to know for this video. But basically, a preposition can be thought of as a helper word to a word in a different form, usually a different type of object. If I say, I put the book on the table, Table is a prepositional object, so it's a different kind of object, and it's supported by the preposition on. And again, if I leave out any of these subjects or objects, the sentence is ungrammatical and nonsensical. So the valency of a verb includes the absolutely required participants of a verb. Obviously, not all verbs are created equal. Valency patterns are the different quantities of participants that verbs require. Using number prefixes, you can describe the valency of a verb. Running through this list, sleep is monovalent because you can only say he sleeps, for example. You can't sleep somebody. A bivalent verb would be throw because it would sound weird if you just said he throws or he is throwing. You have to say what he's throwing, like he is throwing the ball. Give, obviously, is a trivalent verb. I just showed you how you need all three types of objects to make this grammatical. Put is also a trivalent verb, except it requires a direct object, what you are putting, and a prepositional object, which is where you're putting it on or in. Three common questions about valency is, can a verb have multiple valencies at once? Can a verb have a valency of zero? That is to say, have no participants at all? Or can a verb have a valency of even more than three? The answers to these questions are yes, yes but not in English, and kinda? Regarding the first question, a verb can be what's called ambivalent. Ambi means both, like for example the word ambidextrous. Verbs that are ambivalent can either just have a subject or can have a subject and an object, and both are perfectly fine. For example, it's perfectly valid to say, I eat, just like you eat in general, as well as saying what specifically you are eating, as in, I eat pie. Now for the next question, can a verb have a valency of zero? Like I said, yes, but not in English. In Spanish, if it's raining outside, you can just say, llueve, which literally means rains. There's absolutely no subject or object, and this is totally grammatically okay in Spanish. In English, this would be non-standard, but you could maybe have avalent expressions in some colloquial phrases, such as, eh, happens, or sucks. But this is totally non-standard, and you would really only use this in an informal situation. More normally in English, we have it as a dummy subject. If I say it rains, it doesn't actually apply to anything. It's just kind of there to fill in the space, really. 
Some linguists call this avalent because it doesn't really refer to any entity. And finally, can a verb have a valency of even more than three? Well, it's hard to say. It can be argued that the verb bet has a valency of four, but honestly, it depends on which linguist you ask. The prime example sentence is, I bet you four dollars on Robert. So I, you, four dollars, and Robert are all considered by some to be participants of the verb bet. I personally think it counts, but some linguists don't think all of those objects are valid participants in the valency of this verb. For me though, it makes sense, but you can make your own judgment. Now I would like to talk about valency reduction and expansion. This is where a verb can actually gain a quote-unquote electron or lose an electron. First, let's take a look at valency expansion. Again, this is where a verb gains a participant that it normally wouldn't have, and is usually a feature of dialects or poetic features as opposed to standardized language. For example, in the South, you might hear someone say, I'm gonna eat me a pie where me is an additional argument added to the verb, making this, dialectically, a trivalent verb. Or poetically, one may say something like, he sleeps the sleep of death. Now what about valency reduction? For a good example of valency reduction, look no further than Japanese. Remember the verb put, that requires a subject, direct object, and a prepositional object? Well, in Japanese, the prepositional object is actually optional. For example, in Japanese, you can say, Hon oita, which means, literally, I put the book. Where? That can be inferred from context. Japanese is an extremely contextual language, after all. This is also one of the things that makes Japanese really hard to translate into English. Of course, the last valency-reducing operation and probably the one you're most familiar with is the passive. This is where the object of a sentence becomes the first word, and you can choose to delete the subject if you want. The deletable subject is what's called the oblique. I eat the pie, or the pie was eaten by me, or the pie was eaten. Valency reduced. And now, just a quick note. You may or may not have heard of a verb's argument. The difference is, arguments do not include the subject, only the objects, and instead of the words ending in valent, they end in transitive. So, bivalent is intransitive, trivalent is transitive or bitransitive, and quadrivalent is tritransitive. But valency and arguments are two extremely linked concepts, so if you ever hear about arguments, just know it only includes the objects and not the subjects. And that's the end of the video. If you're just looking for the basics. Everything I've set up to this point is pretty basic and it's all you really need for a solid foundation for what verb valency is. If that's all you're looking for, then thank you for watching and have a great day. Otherwise, I'm going to continue into advanced topics in verb valency. First of all, we have reflexives which are syntactically divalent, but semantically they're monovalent because the object and the subject are the same thing, and there's no variance. Therefore, in its meaning, technically, a reflexive construction is monovalent, as opposed to divalent. I wash clothes, for example. Reciprocals are the same thing, but more third person, so like, they wash each other, again. Syntactically divalent, semantically monovalent. In inverse direct languages, where there's an absolute mm -hmm. hierarchy, technically if the inverse case marks a verb, then just saying I killed with an inverse marker would have the same meaning as I, you, killed, inverse marker, but it's already inherent in the verb that you are the one doing it, so therefore this can be seen as a Valency reducing operation. Middle voice is a little archaic term for reflexive, technically, especially found in ancient Greek, but 
Yeah, it's doing something either to yourself or for yourself. Again, semantically monovalent. Then there's object emotion, where you get rid of the object and just say, you know, instead of I cooked food in the kitchen, it's more like I cooked in the kitchen. Just in general. Then we have noun and object incorporation. Noun incorporation is when a certain noun kind of binds with a verb. For example, breastfeed. And then object incorporation is where the object is put in there as well. So babysit. Instead of saying, I sit the baby, it's I babysit. And as for valency expansion, we have causatives and applicatives, which are both so complex to explain them in their fullest would probably take two separate videos. Therefore, I'm just going to go over a quick overview. So causative is basically causing something to do something or to be something. So it's making something do something or be something. In English, at least, we have pairs of verbs, one active and one causative. So you can rise, like make yourself rise, or you can raise something up. You can lie down or lay something down. Cause it to lay down. You can sit or set something down. You can fall down or you can fell a tree. Cause it to fall down. And applicatives are a broad category of syntactic and semantic changes whereby an intransitive verb becomes transitive. So it gains the ability to take an object. So there's type you know, there's different types like benefactive, commutative, locative, or instrumental. So in English, we usually have prepositions for this. Run is an intransitive verb. It takes no object. But outrun does. So I can say, I outrun him. A good thing to remember is that applicatives, unlike normal intransitive, can actually have a passive construction. So I can say, he was outrun by me. And below, we have an example from Swahili in which there's infixes that specifically denote the benefactive quality of that verb. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something, and I hope you were fascinated by this topic as well. If you have any questions, comment section is open, or criticisms, which I would really appreciate because I realize this might not be perfect, but I just hope I was able to give a good basic introduction to verb valency. Catch you next time.